Hey, Jess, can you hear me? Just waiting to see. I can't see. Jessica Hansen. Yes, you can hear me. All right. Okay. It is 11 a.m. and we are going to get this thing kicked off here. So welcome, everybody. We are going to update you with what's going on in the equity markets. And then, of course, some proactive tax planning to wrap up the year 2024. So thank you all for taking the time out of your day to, to come on down and listen to us here. Let's see if I get my buttons to work. So uh, for our clients, our 401k participants, um, our best client is an educated client. So we want to get as much knowledge out to you as we can. So this is something we've been doing for the past few years, getting some information out, and uh, we'll kind of talk about it from here. So as, as we discussed, it's going to be an economic and market update and some uh, proactive tax planning ideas. And that's going to be focused around the five key areas of financial planning, from preservation planning, retirement, tax, estate, and investment planning. So these are the key tenets that will sort of be driving what we're doing here today. So let's jump on into this thing. So right now, this past couple of years, there have been quite a bit of concerns from the equity market. However, the equity market has played real nice. So those of you that have stayed long in the market have been rewarded on that. Um, and there's even opportunity on the safety side as well. But a lot's been going on with inflation, interest rates, a presidential election, global uh, politics. Um, but with that said, the stock market has steamed along. So going through September 26th, we are seeing some all-time highs and some really nice numbers from the U.S. stock market. So now, what are our areas of concern? So the direction of inflation is one. Uh, interest rates uh, would be another, but inflation had gone up in a pretty high number and then is now backed off. Now, one of the issues with that is once the inflation hits, unless we get deflation area, we still get to keep those high prices. So even if inflation isn't going up as much, it puts a strain on the wallet, so to speak. Um, interest rate changes, the Fed was moving them up, 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 up to try and combat that. And in September, we saw a decrease. So we're still looking at recession concerns. That's been going on for about a year and a half now, and it just hasn't hit yet. There are certain areas that have certainly been hit, especially particularly in the real estate space. Um, that is starting to back off a little bit with that Fed reduction of rates. The geopolitical unrest continues to uh, be top of mind. And then, of course, highest top of mind is this U.S. presidential election, which we're a couple of week, uh, weeks away from. So we'll see what happens there. But let's start with inflation. So you can see here the, the two line items is the blue line represents all items and the green line rep represents everything excluding food and energy. Of course, food and energy touches all of us and has the biggest impact there. But right now, the Fed has stated that their goal is to get inflation down to around 2%, jumped pretty high. And recently, we're, we're at about 2.5% after being as high as 9.1% in June of 2022. So inflation is an important driver of things, um, and it's certainly guiding the Fed's policy on interest rate hikes. So this chart here gives you an idea of what's been going on with interest rates going back to the year 2000. Um, so we did enjoy a very long period of very low interest rates. Um, they started to creep up again in 2016, but the COVID um, epi pandemic wound up seeing the Fed dropping them all the way back. Rates went way up, and then you can see the little drop there in September where it's half a, a percentage point. Now, there's been talk that the Fed will continue to lower rates as the year progresses, but we will see. The economy has continued to be pretty good, so maybe they won't. Um, so it just jumps in right what we're talking about here, that they are talking about lowering rates a couple more times. Originally, the bond market had priced in a point and a half of interest rate um, reduction. Now we're seeing rates inside of the bond market it start to go up, which is an indicator that maybe they're not going to lower rates as much as we thought. Um, so we're, we're looking to see the Fed officials are keeping an eye on things and we'll see where that all works out for them. 
Now, recession concerns, they are always <laughs> abundant, but particularly the last year and a half, um, we've felt that there could be areas. As mentioned, there are certain areas of the economy, but really what's going on with AI has helped buoy things and really promoted a big part of the market. A lot of the stocks that are tied into that have done really well, but it's also not just helping tech companies, but a lot of um, traditional type value companies are integrating AI and which is helping quite a bit. So we're seeing it across the board. So that's been something that's helped push off any recession concerns, but still something that could come along. The geopolitical unrest is still real. The Russia Ukraine, Ukraine war is maybe not as much of a headline as it once was, but it, we're still sending them money and they're still going after it over there. The top of headline right now is the situation going on with Israel in Iran and waiting to see is, is how Israel will respond. Um, and so we'll see um, what happens with the world and, and that situation. China continues to create an ease, um, but right now, not much going on. And of course, the big one is going to be the U.S. presidential election. Uh, as usual, it's heated and both have very different philosophies. So I, I, I try to talk about this with clients because it comes up quite a bit. From a stock market perspective, I don't, I'm not really concerned about the election. When you think of all the big crashes that we've had over the past few years, most, if not all of them, are driven from things outside of politics, whether it be the internet bubble crash, the financial crash, um, COVID, uh, the interest rate hike that we had a couple of years ago in 2022 when the market really fell. So didn't have much to do with presidential elections. Market tends to do well, whether it's a Democrat or Republican in office. Now, some of the policies, policies that have been presented could cause some issues if they actually came to fruition, but we'll dig into that a little bit later when we uh, get into the tax uh, situation. Um, now, the good news is we've had a good year, but historically, the fourth quarter is the best year, or excuse me, the best part of the year. And so we'll see. We're going to see how that works out for us um, going into this fourth quarter here. With the last few days, a week or so, we've seen a little bit of a pullback, but things can, let me see what's going on with the market now. Uh, I don't have my numbers up there yet. Okay. It looks like the S&P is up slightly, but the fourth quarter traditionally is the best part of the investment year. So we'll see, maybe we really cl close out with a bang. Um, one thing that we always pound the drum with down here is when you're invested in the equity market, you want to have a long-term focus. It's not a great place to be if you have a short-term goal. So if you're looking to buy a house in a year, you could put your money in the market and it sounds wonderful if it goes up 15, 20%. Uh, but there is a likelihood that it could crash 10, 15% and that could screw up a short-term goal. So when you're invested in the equity markets, if you've got a long-term goal, it can be a really nice place to, uh, to kind of play. And so when we look at this chart here, it shows you over the long-term how the market has done. 10, 20, 34 years, you can tell the trend line is the right way. But on a short-term basis, if you dig deep, you can see on there, there are some nooks and crannies that can certainly cause some pain. So when you're dealing with equities, a long-term perspective is a great way to go. Now, even though we show these charts and we go into this kind of stuff, the historical results are no indication of future results. So caution is still a good place um, to keep in mind, to be, to be cautious in, in this environment right now. So let's think about things that you control. And it's kind of itemized by these four things. The market is going to do what the market does, but there are things that you can do. So it's really important that you understand your tolerance for risk, what your appetite is, um, you know, how much can how much can you handle? What is your time horizon? Again, a long-term time horizon will permit you to be a little bit more aggressive than you would if you had a short-term. Your personal behavior, even if you should be risky, it's a long-term horizon. If you're someone that panics when the market crashes um, and, and, and want to go in when it's going up, that can really um, disrupt your returns. Uh, we run into situations where people want to go all into cash when the market is crashing, and then it becomes very hard to get them back in because maybe they feel like they've missed out. So how do you behave on it? And then what we do is, is work with you to, to find a strategy that can help you stay through it. Um, and then what's your overall strategy? Um, you know, What are you ultimately trying to accomplish? So that's where we're going to help you out with. Those are the things that you can control. So every now and then we like to throw some great words of wisdom in here. And once again, Warren Buffett is top of mind. Successful investing takes time. 
discipline and patience. And if you can do that and, and find opportunities to, to build on, that can work out well for you. So some key takeaways today, caution, still the principal notion for investors. Um, inflation, while it's slowing down, it's still a concern because if the Fed starts lowering rates too much, then we might see it start bumping back up. So we, we have to see where that's at. Interest rates are projected to fall. Um, that will help aspects of the market, particularly real estate, um, and it will help the value of bonds that you may own now, but it will be harder to get income if they do start to fall, but I don't see them going anywhere they were before. Recession is still a possibility and the long-term, you know, equity markets is, is, is a great place to play. So let's move into the tax planning sector. And if anybody has any questions on any of this, just type it in. There should be a little note where you can ask questions on, on the software and I will answer those towards the end of the meeting. So but right now, let's get into the tax planning portion. So this is the fun stuff where, you know, our perspective, it's better to be proactive rather than reactive. So from a tax planning perspective, um, let's kind of dig on in. We're not tax preparers, so it's important for you to know that. Um, we are just here to kind of look at things through a prism of taxes. And of course, all of this, you want to run through your tax professional to make sure everything squares for you. But Everyone's situation is different and we're in different places and there could be folks that were in one set of tax brackets and moving to another, particularly when you retire or if, or if a job is lost. But the first is your 10 and 12% brackets. Those are going to be your lower brackets. Then the mid level is 22 to 24%. And then of the last is going to be our tax sensitive group, 32, 35, 37%. Um, and obviously those brackets are higher and it, can sometimes expand your opportunity, but also limit your opportunity as well. So we'll, we'll dig into those. Now, again, when we think of taxes, we want to look at things that can affect you immediately, short-term and long-term. So we'll, we'll, we'll deal with all that. But right now, let's start by looking at what the tax brackets are today. Um, for those that are single, or married and filed jointly, you can see here that for single, you're the, the lower bracket if your income is around 47 or under, and joint, it's at 94,000. Then it pops up to 22% to 24% at you know roughly 94,000. And then you get up into the top brackets at a married level at 383, and that moves up. So this is the situation that we're dealing with now. This is scheduled to phase out in January of 2026. So depending what happens on this election, could have a big impact on your tax situation. Now, we want to evaluate the use of itemized deductions. The standard deduction amounts now for a single filer or a married filing separately, 14,600. Joint married, um, 29,200. Head of households at 21,900. Uh, you know, in the past, the old rule was to accelerate your deductions, try to get as much as you can now and what we've seen over the last couple of years is we want to try and time or plan our deductions. And so I'll dig into that, particularly on capital gains. So that takes us to the capital gains rate. So you can see an idea of where we're at here. A lot of people don't know this, but there is a 0% capital gains rate up to 47,000 for single filers and up to 94,000 for merit and joint filers. And the 15% rate is uh, goes up pretty high as well, up to well over $500,000 of capital gains. Um, and then over that, you're in the 20% bracket. So there is some tax planning that you can do here, especially at the year end. Um, so let's talk about harvesting. Uh, capital, uh, you know, so a tax loss harvesting is where we try to find losses in your portfolio, sell something and take that loss and you can bank it to offset current or future capital gains. Um, so that is, uh, is, is, a, is a good way to go. If you do not have any capital gains, you can use up to $3,000 of capital loss to offset ordinary income. And that's always the best way because the ordinary income rate is higher as you saw a little bit earlier. Um, something you could also do is when we look at capital losses and capital gains, if someone is in, we go back to this slide here, 
if someone is in a 0% bracket, let's say you retired, your income was high, and now you're living off 70000 a year, Social Security, and a few other things, and you're at this margin right here, you might have fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 of stuff that we could sell at a 0% capital gains rate. So that's where the planning comes into play. If you've re retired recently, if you have a big income downturn this year, there's a window there to potentially unload some stuff that has done very well for you and, and get rid of it at a lower tax bracket. So it's a good time of year to call us, call your tax professional and see what's going on. Um, let's look at retirement plans. So those of you that have are in for our 401k plans, you have a 401k plan at your work. These are the numbers. You, you know, particularly with 401ks and simple IRAs, you have to get the contribution in through your salary reduction. So go ahead and look and see where you're at. If you're under 50 years old and you have a 401k, you can get as much as 23,000 in. If your company offers what's called a simple IRA, you can get 16,000 in. This catch-up provision, if you're 50 or over, you can get an additional 7,500 into your 401k or 3,500 into your simple IRA. SEP, these are designed for smaller companies, maybe one or two person shops. So if you have a SEP IRA, you can get up to 25%. Talk to us about that. And then just traditional IRAs for people that don't have access to company plans, the number is 7,000 for this year that you can get into an IRA or a Roth IRA. Um, and the catch up is 1,000. Again, if you are offered a 401k plan or a simple IRA through your work, there are some potential limitations on contributing to an IRA or a Roth as well. So see us or your tax professional if you are in that situation and you're looking to save more. Now, every presentation, we're always talking about Roth conversions because honestly, it's one of the number one questions that we get around here is converting IRAs to Roth. Um, it can be great in the right situation. It's very difficult to convert to Roth if you're in the highest tax bracket because you got to pay everything right now. If you're in those, those lower tax brackets we talked about, whether it be because you're recently retired or maybe you've, your income at your job has changed, there can be opportunity at year end here where we can take a look at your IRAs and see, okay, how much can we convert and keep you in a lower bracket? Um, so the benefits of it, it lowers your overall taxable income over the long term. Your growth is going to be tax-free on a going forward basis. You do not have to do RMDs at age 73. And ultimately, when the money shifts to your beneficiaries, then they will get it tax-free. So there are some, some benefits. But now when we look at it as regards to giving money to the beneficiaries, when we look at what's called a family tax bracket management, these are for folks that have money in their IRA and they don't need it. They're just thinking about how do I get my money to my heirs in the most tax-efficient manner? And so simple chart, if you are in a higher tax bracket than your kids, it probably doesn't make sense to convert to Roth because it's better for them to get it and pay the tax at their level. However, if you are in a lower tax bracket than your kids, then that's a way to you know, look at it from a family perspective to pay taxes on it on a lower basis right now. And then when they get it at their higher tax bracket, then a, a conversion can work out good. So those are things to think about for folks that have IRAs and you really just don't need them and your plan is just to get them off to your kids, but you wanna do it in the most efficient way possible. 529 plans is a great way to save for education. They've been very popular since their advent and we use them quite a bit around here. The Secure Act 2.0, however, has made it that it is possible to convert 529 plans into Roth IRAs. So there is a way to start saving for Roth IRAs for your children right when they're born. You get them into the 529 plan, and then when you when they get of age later, you can convert some of it. Now, there are limitations. You have to have the plan for at least 15 years. There's a $35,000 cap. When you do the conversion, it's got to be done based on what the maximum amount per year is. So there's some things you got to think about, but there, it's, it is a, a great way to not only save for college, but whatever's left over, or if you intentionally plan it that way, get money into the Roth for your kids. And those numbers those calculations come out incredible um, for the kids if you're able to get that, that kind of money in there. So if you're looking to give money away, the maximum you can give away without a gift tax is going to be $18,000. So keep that in mind if you're looking to make a gift. A lot of people gift to their children, things like that. So it's gone up a little bit each year. And right now, the number for 2024 is $18,000. Again, talk to your tax professional about anything with, that has to do with this. Now, wealth transferring for large estates. 
Um, the number right now is 13.61 million that you can give away without a gift tax. So keep in mind that first 18,000 we just talked about, you can give that away without a gift tax. Anything above that is gonna be taxed at a 40% rate. That applies to when you pass away as well. So if you're in a very large estate, then you know, let's say you're in a, a $50 million estate, between you and a spouse, you'd be able to pass on 27 million tax-free to your heirs at death, but the remaining 23 million is gonna be taxed at a 40% rate. So we have to do planning to create liquidity, particularly if that's tied up in a business, properties, things like that, it, uh, it, can, it can get quite substantial. Now, you also can give away that amount during life. So let's say you had that 18,000, but you really need to get someone 100,000 bucks. You can use part of that um, lifetime exemption now. There's a special form you got to fill out with your CPA, but you can use that and you can give up the 13 million during your life right now. And if you do it correctly, you can avoid that 40% tax. Um, so something to think about, we've got on here the sunset in 2026. In January of 2026, that is set to be reduced to $7 million. If someone were to say, well, I want to hedge my bet to make sure I get it out now, someone could get that 27 million out of their estate right now, a couple, I should say, 13.61 uh, million for an individual. They could get it out. Um, and even if the number sunsets afterwards, if you did it in the current year, you're grandfathered in. So those are going to be things that will become a little bit more real when we get into September, October, November of 2025, because we will see if the government is able to fix it. Depending on what side of the aisle you're on, we probably all agree it's probably not going to find a, a solution, but we'll see. <laughs> now, for those of you that um, have IRIS, eventually the government wants their money. So you, when you hit age 73, you have to do what's called a required minimum distribution, an RMD. You may have heard that. That used to be at age 70 and a half, but now um, it has changed to 73. So some people, like we've talked about earlier, don't need the money in their IRA. So if we have to take this money out, you're going to have to pay taxes on it. One thing you can do is a qualified charitable distribution, and that's where you can take your RMD out. And if you donate directly to a charity, you have the ability to avoid any income tax on that. So that can be very powerful, especially for folks that are already giving to charitable entities anyways. Um, they also did keep it so that you could start that at age 70 and a half, the, the qualified charitable distributions, even though you don't have to take an RMB at that age, if you want to start that process up. It's a way to get money out tax-free from your IRA. So keep that in mind. So the tax law changes, let's look at what's coming. Um, if the government doesn't do anything, then the individual income tax rates will change. They are going to go up, and we will look at those, and they're, they're quite substantial. Uh, the estate tax exclusion would return to the pre-2018 levels. Uh, the SALT cap will disappear. I know that has been very unpopular in high-tax states like California, New York, and Illinois. That's scheduled to disappear. Child tax credit will revert to 1000 and the alternative minimum tax will revert as well. So now let's look at these tax brackets. So this is a good slide to focus on uh, because it shows you where we're at now and what the brackets were in 2017 and what we'd expect to go back to. So you can see that this will affect a lot of folks, especially in, you can see in the lower bracket. So if you've got someone that's making $80,000, right now they would be in the 12% bracket but when things sunset, they would move up to the 25% bracket. So that's a substantial increase. You can see that across the board through a lot of different things. So if we dig in a little deeper here, um, if you've got a couple with 175,000 of income, then they would see them go from a 22% bracket to a 28% bracket. If you have folks that are in the 350,000 income level, their taxes would go from 24% to 33%. So there's some, some significant tax increases that are coming uh, unless the government puts something together. So uh, we got a plan for what is. So we want to be proactive. Again, if those things come to fruition, the end of next year, these presentations we're doing are going to be really important. Um, so what can you expect from us? 
we're going to review um, changes that may affect you. We'll continue to have regular communication, more frequent with discussions. Um, we like to send our newsletters out, send them email. We put them on our website, mail them out, uh, but also do these presentation as well to, to keep you up to speed. And of course, our normal regular reviews uh, that you, we offer as well. For people that are participants in our 401k plans, we also offer reviews to you as well. So if you'd like that, uh, please do reach out to us. Um, so you may know other people out there that uh, would be interested in this type of help. Maybe they don't want to meet with me yet. I don't want to come on these seminars. We can add them to our newsletter list, but you know, we'd love to help the folks that are important to you. Don't keep us a secret. We, you know, someone at some point introduced us, you to our firm and, you know, we know everybody's very happy right now. So, so keep that in mind. We're always very grateful for folks that are able to, uh, to help share this information. Maybe they want to sit on this webinar. Maybe they want to, you know, we'll, we will record this as well. So you'll be able to, to share that too. Now, very important part of the whole meeting here is our compliance information. So this is crucial. Make sure you read this from top to bottom and um, keep that going. Let me see if we have any questions here. Then yet, if you had a question, what would it be? So just think about that. It looks like we've got a big group come in here today. So that's that's really good. Um, if you got a question, pop, go ahead and, and send that. But with that said, I do want to thank you all. Appreciate the opportunity to assist you with your financial needs. Your health and well-being is always our highest priority. So continue doing your thing. Um, call us if you have maybe more personal questions, feel free. And let's see here. I do have some Q&A here. Here we go. All right. Um, do you see bigger upside from small cap stocks or large cap stocks over the next 12 months? So right now, the pundits are banging the drum on small cap stocks. For our managed portfolios, we have been adding small cap stocks to our portfolios. They are tend to be a little bit more volatile. And if we do hit in a recession, they, they can be a little bumpy. But a lot of the analysts that we're following are predicting that small cap stocks um, might move into favor on a going forward basis. So we do have to keep in mind to be measured with our, like I said, just because it can be much more volatile when they go up, they go up pretty quickly. So that is a, a part of our portfolio for our managed accounts that we have been introducing into the accounts. Uh, for anybody that's in our 401k plans, we cannot manage those accounts, but you are welcome to call us and we can have uh, a conversation and help educate on the various options and things that are out there. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, that's kind of what's going on. Any other things, any other questions? Okay. Short of another question popping up soon, this will be available in a few days um, on the web. So you're welcome. If you run a 401k plan, we would encourage you to share this with your all your participants. Uh, it's good to keep up with your fiduciary re responsibility for education, but also, you know, they might get some good tidbits out of here. And always know that all of you are welcome to give us a call. We can dig in a little deeper with some of these things here. Drop us an email call. We're happy to help. So that's all we've got for today. I appreciate you taking the time to come out and joining us. And we will talk soon. Have a good one.